That's so fun, man. What a good time. Really love Jesus, man. That's been one of my deep desires for this community is that we'd be a community that loves Jesus well. And that when we leave this place every Sunday that we were able to love Jesus and that was the number one focus and priority for us and we achieved it together as a church family. That's the number one, right? And um, there's a lot of needs of people. There's a lot of opportunity to love people. And so that's the second goal for sure is to love people well uh, in this place. And so I love those times of worship where it's a, it's a absolute Jesus time. It's really amazing. It's, it's my personal subjective favorite time. And uh, today I'm actually going to be talking about prayer out of Matthew 6. Um, and it wasn't actually my plan. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I kind of wanted to um, just take a moment to talk about, you know, sermon preparation because I think it relates to our life on how we hear from God. Because there's a lot of different ways you can prepare a sermon and approach it. Um, and I prepared one on joy, and it was pretty good, I think. I never preached it, but I uh, was driving this morning, and I just really felt like I was supposed to talk about prayer. And so then I switched up and switched the kind of approach there. And you might have heard other preachers do that. And, and you might get really excited when that kind of thing happens. It might add more value to the sermon if it was spontaneously changed. Um, but whether God spoke it originally or God had you change what you were going to communicate about, uh, to me the value is that you're just partnering with whatever God's saying. No matter the order that it was given, whether spontaneous or structured or planned and such. So I think it's really interesting the, the way we choose to focus on specific things God's saying. Because this Bible is really big. And there's a lot of narratives, a lot of messages, a lot of principles, a lot of things God's saying. So you can't focus on all of them every single day. And so your approach to what part of what God's saying and what part of God you're focusing on is actually really important to become aware of. Uh, are you the kind of person that you just want it to be spontaneous every single time? You want your word to just, you, you drop your Bible and wherever it opens to, that's where God led you to? Or are you on a reading structure and plan? The, the point for me is that we, we become uh, well-versed on our ability to discern what God is saying and doing, no matter whether it's in our personality type or outside of it. You remember with Elijah, he taught him to hear differently. So it wasn't in the fire from heaven. It wasn't in the earthquake. It was in the whisper. So God will change the way he's um, talking to you specifically. And sometimes he'll actually talk to you in a way that he totally understands that's how you need him to talk uh, to you. And so he can do any of these things, but you can always understand that God's a perfect father. And so whatever he is doing is perfect and is the most loving and truthful thing that can happen to you in your life. So being really well-versed on understanding how to hear from God uh, in ways that are convenient or inconvenient, the ways that match your personality on how you like to communicate, or ways that are outside of your personality preference. Uh, I know that I love revelation. I love wisdom. I love when light bulb moments happen with God, you know, where you're like, oh, dude, that's so cool. You know what I mean, those moments? I love those moments. And then I want to have those moments all the time, but then I realize that you can't just go from light bulb to light bulb and never become the revelation that you are being impacted by. So it's just important that we understand these things. And so anyways, I, I, I changed the narrative what I was going to preach today and, and prepared uh, out of Matthew 6. And so if you could join with me in those places of Matthew 6, uh, we're going to talk about hypocrisy and prayer. So it's a, it's a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. We're good right now. We're already in agreement and we're on the same page. Uh, so I want to invite you to a little preface and to seeing this approach is that the genuineness of your heart and your communication is extremely important when it comes to you talking to God. This is so important. You got to see genuine and sincere. You got to see the sincerity of heart as being really closely correlated and connected. It's living in the same bucket when it comes to Jesus' commentary on prayer. So he confronts hypocrisies of different kinds, and he establishes the appropriate communication posture or pattern in the Lord's Prayer. So we see, though, in the same like paragraph argument stretch, Jesus establishes a confrontation over disingenuous uh, behavior, over uh, motivations of the heart things, 
Uh, and then he establishes a healthy relational communication between us and God through the model of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so I want to make sure that we see this. And we're, we're learning today and we're observing today that the genuineness of our expression is foundational when it comes to communicating with God. So if you aren't genuine in your heart, then there's a lack of communication connection happening. Uh, and so let's jump into this word so we can make it very biblical for our understanding here is genuine and sincere heart motivations are important to understand and to be in the context of talking to God uh, and or doing things with God. So in verse 6, we see, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Okay, so Jesus right away is confronting something. And what he's confronting is this behavior, this good, righteous behavior that's done with the misplaced heart motivation to be seen by others. And this is a little bit of a challenge because this doesn't only call for righteous behavior, this actually calls for pure motivations on those righteous behaviors, which is next level. It moves beyond religion, which is the right behaviors as parents and actions apparent to others. And, and it moves to the place of actual Jesus purity of heart, which says, not only do I want you to do the right thing, but I want your heart to be doing it for the right reasons. Which, man, is that a daunting task. That's challenging, and uh, it's, it's really interesting because it's impossible to police. It's impossible for a community to create a system that polices heart intent. It's impossible for us to eliminate people in leadership if their heart motivations aren't pure like Jesus is because it's extremely hard to track. It's the heart. God can see the heart, but it takes us a good deal of process and time sitting with somebody to be even able to fold back the layers and see what's happening in their heart. So this means that uh, true communication with God, true expressions of righteousness uh, we have to confront in a relationship with God, in a communication with God, we've got to confront our heart's motivation. And this gets really, really personal really fast. And this gets really challenging really quickly if we're actually doing it. And in verse 2 it says, Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret re will reward you. Okay, so we got two things going on right away. Again, Jesus is on that train of confronting uh, the motivation of the heart. And when I am doing something good so that I can be seen and praised and celebrated by others, I've got to track whether or not I'm getting sustenance and motivation from people's praise. So if you can track this truly and understand that you are doing good things because people are celebrating you and it gives you energy to do it again then part of your diet of motivation is the praise of man. So here's the challenge. You could be like, well, what's so bad about that? I like to be complimented. I like to be celebrated. I like to be championed. I like people to tell me I'm doing a good job. So what's so wrong with that? Well, here's the thing, is when Jesus is confronting this, uh, to do good things so that you'll be praised by man, it means that a part of your daily bread a part of your sustenance is actually coming from the table of people. So you're sitting at the table and people are feeding you and your behavior is continuing as a result of what they're feeding you. Uh, and this becomes a heart level issue between you and Jesus because uh, your daily bread is supposed to come from God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So the, the issue here is what is sustaining your behavior? If it's people, if it's the people pleasing, if it's the praise of people, then you've got to go to a heart level with God and allow him to root up those places of sustenance that come from the praise of people. 
Uh, this can be, I can give like pragmatic advice, right? Like if you allow God to uproot these things, you can actually be pretty much manipulation proof. Uh, you could be control proof. Uh, because when God is determining your behavior exclusively, uh, then men can't withhold praise to manipulate you or give you praise to manipulate you. So pragmatically speaking, you can be a person of, of true rooted integrity that is not people conditioned, that is not people based, that is not reliant on human beings who inherently are very inconsistent. If you find one good one, you'll probably find a few tough ones, a few problematic ones, maybe a few conniving ones, maybe a few robbers and thieves amongst the good. And this is just the reality of it. There's sheep, there's wolves, there's all kinds of different folks. And so when you're actually removing your need for the diet of people's praise, of people's affirmation, is you're actually choosing then to sit at the table, uh, the banqueting table that God has prepared for you and his sustenance for your behavior and his things he's giving you to nourish your actions can actually take place. When you choose to leave the buffet table of people and sit at the buffet table of God, then you have the appropriate heart motivation to do the right things. So you, you've got to allow behavior to go deeper than just surface, and it's got to go to the heart places. So I'll say this. If you tithe only because your parents or your grandparents taught you to tithe growing up, and you haven't begun to give God your money as a result of a heartfelt place, I would encourage you to actually go to that place of real intimate relationship with Jesus that understands the tithe, that understands the offering, and isn't just doing it because it was instructed by somebody else to do it. If you are volunteering because someone told you and celebrated and told you you should serve and you should volunteer, uh, I would encourage you to go beyond that human encouragement and praise and understand on a deep level why you are volunteering, why you are donating, why you are giving your time and energy, why you are building that thing. Uh, really going beyond just reactionary actions that are like, oh, I'm a, uh, a rat in a maze that whenever I get cheese, I've learned to go that direction. Are you guys following with me right now? So we've got to go beyond this just like we are being cheesed around the maze by people that want us to go a certain direction or want us to get out of the maze. And we've got to remove our uh, associations from people praise that move my behavior and that move my trajectory, that move my destinations. We've got, to, we've got to remove all of that movement from people and we've got to give all of that movement, inertia, and gravity to God. This is a profound process. And I love altar calls. I love praying for somebody in a service, but this goes way beyond a two-and-a-half-minute impartation call on a service on Sunday. And this goes to the very depth of who you are, how you were constructed, how you were knit in your mother's womb by God. This goes to the very depth of who you are, and it actually is a requirement at this point that we learn intimate communication with God. We learn intimate places of prayer and understanding for God. And if we're going to move into this place, we've got to understand the foundation of true communication with God to come from a secret place communication, to come from a secret place connection. And we see this in verse 5, and it says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Man, love that confrontation. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in the secret. And your Father who sees in the secret will reward you. Here's what's interesting to me. It tells you the location of Heavenly Father. He's in the secret. If you feel like an orphan, if you feel estranged, very simply I would encourage you to go find him in the secret place. It will cure your orphan mindset. It will liberate you. It will establish son and daughter mindsets in you. I love it when the Bible tells me where, where, where Heavenly Father resides and where he lives. 
where he's perhaps waiting for me to move towards what he's doing in my life. I love when it says he's standing at the door of my life knocking, the door of my heart knocking, waiting for me to let him in. It's describing the posture, the approach of Heavenly Father. It's describing his location in terms of my lifestyle. So what is the secret place for us? What does the secret place look like for us? I mean, it's a sermon series you'll probably have heard before. It's, it's a passing phrase. It's a Christian idea. But I'll say this is there's a reason why Jesus confronts uh, the relationship with God that is only done in public and isn't done in private. And the foundation of our Christian journey and walk, the health of that relationship is, in, is established in a one-on-one, private, intimate scenario. If I only had, and I liken this a lot to marriage because I think it's helpful, but if I only had a relationship with my wife in public, then we would really struggle. So when when we're talking about relationship with Jesus, we're talking about having the courage to be one-on-one. We're talking about having the vulnerability to be one-on-one. We're talking about spending time in a one-on-one way with God who sees everything. I mean, that's a daunting, daunting reality right away. But I like it because all of a sudden, the deepest places of shame of your life are going to have a reckoning with God right there. When you're in a one-on-one scenario, you can't hide in the crowd. When you're in a one-on-one secret place scenario, you can't have a via relationship. A via relationship is interesting. Have you ever had uh, like two friends? One friend that you're really the friend with and the other friend that you're friends because your friend's friends with them? And then your real friend leaves the room and you don't know what to say to your not real friend yet? There's a Seinfeld episode about this where Elaine and uh, George Costanza, they're not real friends. They're friends because of Jerry, right? And then Jerry leaves the room and they don't know what to say and they're like, okay, all right. And for some of us, that's exactly our relationship with God. We're super comfortable with God when the pastor's in the room or the another Christian mature leader's in the room, but then you invite me or tell me I need to be one-on-one with God, and it's, it's, it's awkward. It's awkward because I don't know what to say. I don't know if I should be talking the whole time. I don't know if I know enough verses. I don't know if I'm naked in front of him. Like, how does God see me? Does he see me as sinful and naked? Does he see me as a leper? Does he just want to have fun with me? Am I doing this wrong? Am I thinking too much? Should I not be thinking at all? Should I be saying something? I should probably be confessing something. God, there's something in my life that I don't know about. Please don't kill me. (laughs) And all of a sudden, your brain's moving real fast, and you don't know what to do. The first time I ever tried to do this, I went into my actual closet to pray to God. And after about 60 seconds of praying all of my needs and praying out loud, and I even yelled a little bit to sound more passionate Christian to myself, you know. And then I was like, what am I supposed to do the rest of the 59 minutes of this hour in the prayer closet? And then it's just awkward. I remember the first, I was just like, what do I even do in this place, God's secret place? What am I just supposed to like, can I fall asleep? Are you going to be disappointed with me if I fall asleep? Should I have music on? It's a little awkward in this place without music on. Um, What are you doing right now? Are you in this closet? Do I need to be in this closet? Should I be on my face, prostrate before the Lord? Man, you start to get into that place, even of just private time with God and just thinking about interacting with God, and you don't even know the rules. You don't even know the rules, and you actually probably have a whole ton of preconceived notions about what it's supposed to look like. Probably 95% of them are you're going to think of interacting with God in that scenario like it's a church service, but just alone. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Nobody's playing an instrument for you. Nobody's singing like Beth and Alisa. Nobody's just like, oh, wow, the drums are not in my prayer closet, even though I wish they were. Man, that would be so cool if Lane was just in there just and just moving around and hitting the drums with me. That would be so much fun. But the reality of it is, is there's, it's, it's silent. It's silent. And if you're awkward with silence, you're going to get real awkward real quick. So the point of this is, okay, so, so plow through the awkwardness. Plow through all of your misconceived notions and concepts. You might not feel any glorious feelings 
for a long time. You might think on him and meditate on him. You might get an idea. You might get pragmatic solutions on things. You might not get much of anything but just spending time. But I can guarantee you this. If you allow yourself to establish a one-on-one relationship through private times, then it will establish a communication line that is much healthier and much more foundationally uh, good for your whole life. And it will avoid hypocrisy expressions of Christianity that take place when you are devoid of an intimate expression of relationship with Jesus. So if you have a public expression of relationship with Jesus, but not a private, be aware of the hypocrisy that is there. So all of a sudden, Jesus starts to confront these things and say these things, and he says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. They think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. How interesting, that phrase, when I first read that phrase, I thought it was so interesting because then I realized that I actually don't need to say out loud what I need because God already, already knows what my needs are. So here's the next question I asked. So God, do I need to say it out loud? Do I need to pray? Okay, well, maybe I need to pray, but maybe I don't need to say my needs because you already know them. So can I just skip the informing of needs part and then get to the next part of the conversation. All of a sudden, when you understand that God knows what you need already, you don't even need to inform him. It does change the way you're talking to him. See, when my wife and I are working on stuff, like, she needs to inform me of her needs. Like, she really does. And maybe I should have already known it by now. Like, I try and learn all the micro expressions that everybody has. You know what I mean? Like, I've been working with my friend Brandon on stuff, and Brayden, there he is. And, and I was telling him, I'm like, I'm trying to, like, communicate with just facial expressions with you sometimes. Just for fun. You know what I mean? Just to make a game of this whole kind of partnership stuff. And so with my wife, I'm trying to, like, look and see, like, oh, okay, I think that that means all of these words. You know what I mean? And we can get, like, relational shorthand. Does anybody else play this game? Okay, I'm crazy. I do. But God doesn't require you to communicate your need. He already knows. So then you're praying not to inform him of your needs, but you're praying for another reason. So if we're going into the Lord's Prayer, the first line of this thing is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So right away you know that you're not saying that to inform God that he is a hallowed name. Right away you know that you're not actually saying that phrase for his benefit. Because God is great and he doesn't need your word contributions to be great. So then you understand that your side of the communication with God is not informing him of your need or changing his status or changing the way he feels about you. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you're not communicating with him so that you can get your needs met. You aren't communicating with him so that he could be altered or changed. You are communicating with him so that you can change. So that you can align your conscious understanding with the reality of who he is. Which means the reason why he starts with hallowed be your name is because in our daily life, we oftentimes are not in a reverence point. We're in a casual, moving quick, getting stuff done, solving stuff, cleaning stuff. Yesterday I fixed my backyard up and it was awesome. And I crushed it. And my wife didn't help me even though she said she was going to. So I was alone. And I told her for the rest of the day, I was like, I crushed that backyard. I was like, you know who didn't help me? And she starts laughing. You know, we had that relationship. But uh, so I, so you, you're not telling God who he is so it changes his status. You're telling him so that you can be affected by the reality of who he is. His name is hallowed. He is your father. So there is a status of relationship there that you should recognize. He's Abba. He is your father. You've been brought into the co-heirs inheritance fold with Jesus. But also, he's in heaven. He's in heaven, which is a reminder of his sovereignty. 
it's a reminder that he is the Lord of your life, that he is of the highest order and the highest place. So our Father in heaven is powerful intimacy established and at the same time reverence for the place of yieldedness you need to have for his name and who he is. It's the appropriate amount of reverence for God. And it's starting, it's starting you off in that communication with God of reminder of that posture, of reminder of that place. Because again, you're more about the communication in your prayer with God is not about informing him or changing him, but it's about aligning yourself with him. It's about connecting yourself with him. So right away you're like, oh, hallowed be your name. And you get into that place of fear of the Lord and reverence for God. And it's important because the next line is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is powerful. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is a prayer communication to God, a reminder and alignment moment where I am forfeiting the desire for my will. Again, I'm forfeiting my will for God's will. I'm yielding my will for the Lord's will. I think that the Lord's Prayer is a really great marriage prayer. Because if you really think about it, the most, like a beautiful marriage is one that has that worship of the Lord centerfold to the relationship. Both parties yielding and worshiping God and, and revering God in their life. Both parties in that place of yieldedness to God, with humility with God. Both parties in that place. And, you know, if you've ever gone to premarital or got any kind of Christian counseling, there's the pyramid scheme, right? Remember this one? If you ever went to premarital, is there's God, and then there's the two parties, and as you grow closer to God, you uh, grow closer to one another because it's a triangle. You guys ever heard this one? It's a cute little visual. It's good. It's helpful to understand kind of what's happening is as you revere and get close to God, it's actually a unifying agent to your marriage, this is the same thing actually in relationship with anybody. We have one God, one Father in heaven. It's what actually causes the unity of the brethren. As we get more like God, we become more unified together. Isn't that fun? Ah, we shed off all those impurities and we become more like God in character and integrity, which makes us work together better, understand one another better. And the same thing's happening in our marriage. So you start in relationship or in marriage in this place of hallowed be God's name in my marriage. What does that look like for me to be yielded to God in his will? So a marriage isn't about my wife or our marriage isn't about my wife achieving my will and vision. And it's not about me achieving her uh, will or vision. It's about together us yielding to the vision and the will of God for our life and our covenant partnership. So when push comes to shove, who wins the argument is God. So when push comes to shove, when, when my will against her will and we're wrestling over that thing, we ought to be able to spend some time with God and realize God's will. We ought to spend some time with the Holy Spirit and allow him to humble us, allow him to soften our hearts. We ought to spend time with God and it should be able to unify us together, yield our wills together, and find that overarching lordship will, and that should help in the conflict of the wills. It changes a marriage, right? From being about one person having power or the other person having power to get what they want done to both utilizing their power to partner with the will of God. It's where we cast our crowns, you know, the band and the, the whole idea. We cast our crowns before the Lord. We give him we give him our power. We give him our influence. We give him our authority. We give him those places of capability and skill. We give him those places of passion and power. and We give him that. So with my wife, it's very interesting to talk about because I have a certain personality and she has a certain personality. So when we're trying to figure out a movie, almost always she's going to be like, well, you know, what do you want? And she really wants to watch what I want to watch. So I got to try and trick her to figure out what she wants to watch. You know what I mean? And I got to kind of like play like some kind of boxing game with her so I can figure it out, you know? Otherwise, if I say like, oh, I really want to watch this, she'll be like, oh, you know what? I have nine other things I'd rather watch, but I want to partner with what you want to watch. So I got to like try and like do that thing where they hide the thing under the cup. You know what I'm talking about? 
yeah, so I'm trying to like hide my, what do I want to watch? You know, and I, oh, no, but, oh, I found what you want to watch. Let's watch that. You know, and it's, it's a fun little game we play because it's just a, a, a microcosm, though, of, of partnership, of understanding what that person wants, and then trying to work with the Lord on our relationship, especially with the things that actually matter. Like, watch the movie. Uh, but the things that actually matter, where we live, what our vocation is, what our time spent is, what our hobbies are like, what our sacrifices are like, what our financial expressions are like, these are the things that we've got to yield to the Lord together. These are the things as a church we've got to yield to the Lord. These are things as a community we've got to yield to the Lord. This place of yieldingness to God and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven comes right off of the heels of a reverence for the Lord. It's this alignment place with God that the most important and the highest order of your life and my life is that we're aligned with his will. We're aligned with his will. And this isn't something that just happens on a surface level. This is something that needs to happen on a heart level. And how crazy is this that the prayer life that we have, it's about alignment. It's about transformation. It's about worship. How fun is that? How exciting is that? I wrote just like a quick phrase on this. Is that it goes from worship to alignment to gyra because the next point here is that you pray, okay, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. What an interesting statement. One, I don't really need to pray for bread. I don't. I can eat every single day, and I don't need to pray for bread. And a lot of people are in this place. Most of us aren't starving. So a lot of people are in this place where we don't actually need to pray for literal bread. So, so you should meditate on why is Jesus instructing you to pray like this? What is he talking to you about? Well, I understand that when I reflect and I meditate on this, I understand. I, I look at the first part there daily. I go, that's so interesting, daily. So he speaks to a frequency. He speaks to a daily posture. And what is he asking me to do every single day? Well, he's asking me to focus with him and, and, and talk to him about the things that need to come in a daily sense. So I see Jesus in this place inviting me out of regret in my past into the present. Or I see Jesus inviting me away from the fear of tomorrow into my present. So I actually see Jesus partnering with the way I relate to time and myself. Forgive yourself. Let go of some of those things in the past that have continually kept you imprisoned in your history and regret. And let go of the fears and the worries about tomorrow. And actually later in this chapter, it talks about that. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. And so let go of those things which are yesterday and those things which are coming and allow yourself to learn to be present with God every single day. Down to the very basic needs of your diet and what you need to eat. It's learning to trust God and be present every single day with God. There's a thing I want to say about this present thing because we, we talk a lot about the presence of God in a church culture. We talk a lot about it. I mean, a lot about it. And uh, what's really, really interesting is that when we ask God, and I want to encourage you to be aware of this, when we ask God to come into the room, it's in some senses a little odd. Like God is always with you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. So it's a little odd, right? It's almost a little inaccurate to the nature of God to ask him to come into the room when he's already in the room. Right? It'd be a little bit weird if I were to be like, hey, come to church this Sunday, and you're already here. It'd be like, that's a little odd. Why did he ask me to come to church? I'm already here. So I, I want you to be aware of this, not because, you know, you're going to be sinning if you, in the next service you're in, you're like, God, come into the room, God, you know? I, so it's not so much about, like, policing, like, oh, you said that wrong, and, you know, stumbling over words like that. But it's understanding, like, when you're talking to God, do your best to have an accurate understanding of who he is. And know that some of your communication with God, you're, if you're like praying desperately for him to come, you might not get past stage one because you're asking him to come into the room, but he's already here. So there was no shift in God. All that needs to take place is your understanding of where he's actually at. So again, you're praying not so God can change, but so that your understanding can change. He's already here. So what do you do when God's already present? It's different than what you do if you're trying to get him to come. Like if I want somebody to come to my birthday party, I invite them. I send out an invitation, I call them, I communicate them so they come. But if they're already at my birthday party, I'm going to do something different. 
I'm going to eat with them, laugh with them, laugh with them, a lot more laughing with them. You know, I'm going to spend time with them. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to get gifts from them, and maybe I'll give them a gift back if I feel generous, you know. (laughs) But I'm going to do something different if they're already here than if they weren't here yet, and I'm trying to get them to come. And I actually believe that this changes the nature of how we relate to God when we understand where he's at. Where do you understand that he's already present? He was already there in the midst of your argument with your spouse or your friend. He was already there in the midst of your pain, in the midst of you being betrayed, stabbed in the back. He was already there in the midst of you, dot, dot, dot. So you change and you, you shift the way you're relating to yourself, to your situation, to your environment, to the moment. It changes it. So if I'm asking for somebody to be healed, I'm asking a God who's right there, right? Not a God who's up there and I need to pray the right prayer and jump through the right hoops so he'll show up. See, I'm asking a God who's right there, who already is aware and compassionate and empathetic to that person's need to be healed much more than I am. If anything, I'm trying to catch up to how God feels about people. He's not trying to catch up to my information. Hey, God, just to update you, you know, Marina needs this, or Tay needs that, or my friend over here needs that. Like, I'm not informing God of something he's already not uh, deeply aware of. So I'm communicating with him, and we're communicating together because we're trying to understand our Father. We're trying to intimately be aware of what his will is. We're trying to trust him. And our prayer life is about achieving those places of awareness and trust in God. So if you don't know where God is, stop the train, wait, and reflect. Become aware. Know that he's in the room and he can update you. He can make you feel what he feels. God has this ability to communicate more than just conscious thought. He can communicate to your spirit. He can impact your soul. And you might not know and you might not be proficient in soul language or in spirit impact language. You might not be proficient in it. You might not have ever done it. But I'm telling you right now, if you become aware and you become present in God's presence, it changes things. It changes the way you feel. It changes the way you relate to your life. It changes everything. See, take a look at the disciples when they're in the boat. Jesus was present on the boat. But they weren't locked into the reality of what that meant. So their perception needed to change, right? And so if you're a mess and you're like, dude, my boat is crazy. It's about to get sunk right now. Then at least do what the disciples did. Even though it wasn't really full of faith, at least they went to him and go, Jesus, don't you even care? Don't you you care that I'm going to die? If that's all you got in a one-on-one communication with God, good. Go with it. Go with it. Because God's not going to kick you away because you don't say it right. I'm serious. Look at all the places in the Bible where they didn't say it right. They didn't approach Jesus right. And what did he do? He didn't turn them away and reject them. Yeah, sometimes he confronted it. He did confront the disciples, but he also brought peace. Right? He's like, oh, you have little faith. Oh? Oh? That's jacked up, Jesus. I was just scared. <laughs> so, so this communication, this prayer with God, it, it's, it's not a transactional thing we do on a Sunday to heal someone, deliver someone, or make someone feel comforted. It's not a thing we just do at the altar or in our prayer room upstairs. It's not just a thing we do in deliverance session. It's not just a thing we do in some kind of laying on of hands to get a gift. See, this is just elements of a communication and partnership with God, right? So when you're talking to God about somebody else's life, right? So say I'm praying for Jake, man, and say I want Jake to get healed, right? I'm not just praying a magical prayer that will unlock God's will, that he'll do it if I actually pray that magical prayer because he didn't want to do it before, but since I jumped through these magical word hoops, he's actually going to heal him. See, this is like a, this is some kind of secretive, almost even like coy and manipulative God picture. So when I'm talking to God, God loves me. He's my father. Also, he's Jake's. 
So when I'm praying for Jake, and I know that he's both of our fathers, it changes the way I pray for Jake. It changes the way Jake relates to me. Because I'm not his father. God's his father. So we relate to the situation differently. So we're coming together to understand God, to ask God for something short, but we already know he knows our needs. So what is happening in me in that moment? What place of transformation and trust is taking place and is being unlocked? What place of healing is God doing in my life? I want to know and I want to receive it. And I want to be present in that moment because he's a good God. He's doing a perfect thing. And I want to see it. I want to partner with it. I want to receive it. I want to be there to catch it. I want to be with it. I want to be wherever he's at doing whatever he's doing. See, that's that partnership and that's that posture with God. That's intimate. It's declining hypocrisy, surface, surface expressions to just be accepted by people. And it's saying, God, I actually want to have a real interaction with you. Even if I'm terrified, even if I'm full of doubt, I want it to be real. So let's have this real secret place interaction. My heart's sick. I'm full of doubt, full of fear. But here's where I'm at. I can't do better. I can't do better right now. I can't conjure up better than this. You're going to have to heal me, deliver me. You're going to have to do a thing if you want me to be different. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. Humble yourself before the Lord. If you don't have the right words in that secret place, cool. At least be in the secret place. It doesn't say go to the secret place and have all the right words. It doesn't say go to the secret place and be perfect or come in perfect to the secret place. You know, even the next lines here, it's and give us this day and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. So go into the secret place with debts. What's your debt to the Lord? What's your sin pattern? Go in there with your debt and ask God to forgive you, and then he's going to provoke your heart to forgive the debts that others have towards you. So he wants you to come in with your debts. The next line is really awesome, too, and lead us into tem- not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So go in there with debts, go in there with evil, go in there with manipulation in your heart, go in there with a grody, icky, nasty, shameful set of patterns of behavior, go in there with all the debauchery of your life, go in there with all the prostitution of your heart and all the adultery of your mindsets, go in there with all of the sin and all of the shame and just be like, here I am, I'm disgusting. Here I am, I'm gross. Here I am, I am wicked. Here I am, I am not righteous without you. Here I am, my heart is wicked and deceitful. It's manipulative, and I don't even want that. But then I do want that. I do want the flesh stuff, and I do want the pride stuff. I do want the lust stuff, but I also want you. So I'm going to go in there with the reality of the composition of my life, not some censored, baloney, religious expression. So if you want to learn to pray with the Lord in a secret way, then learn to come naked. I know that sounds weird, right? I'm not saying literally you have to be naked. Although, small fact, I also did that in my closet. <laughs> I was like, come in, I'm coming naked before you, Lord. That was right in the same time I tried to walk through the wall. <laughs> Did I ever tell you that story? I tried to walk through a wall? No? I was like, Jesus walks through a wall. So I'll do even greater things, thus I think I could walk through this wall. I promise you guys in college I tried it. I was like, full on Nazarite moment, story to end this thing and we'll pray. I was like, I'm going to walk through this wall. So I walked up to the wall and I walked and I tried to walk through the wall. I didn't. But... In my mind, I lacked faith. Because I walked slow. I kind of like braced for impact. You know what I mean? So I was like, let's try this again, but this time I'm running. I'm not putting my hands up. I'm not bracing for impact. I promise you, I ran into the wall. I didn't put my hands up, and I just... It was good. It was good, and I did not get to tell others of the testimony of me walking through the wall. I did not get to tell others about the divine signs and wonders that God was doing in my life, and I was an awesome Christian. So I want to pray with you, and then we've got some communion, so you can come and grab it at any point you want. 
in your time of prayer. But I want you to close your eyes. I want to pray with you. So God's in the room right now, right? We are, we are aware of that. We know that biblically this is a fact. So my entire kickoff to this activation, to this time spent with the Lord, is for you to act and communicate in that way. One, recognize it. He's here. So what's he saying to you? What's he feeling? What are you saying to him? What are you feeling? Does it induce guilt and shame and fear to realize that God sees everything, even your brokenness and your shameful things? Does it, does it provoke an excitement? Does it provoke a desire to change? What are you going to say to him in that place? What are you going to communicate? Does he have your heart? Does he know it? Do you know it? All of these things, being real before the Lord as he is present right now. Choose to allow yourself to be present in that place of presence. To being very much alive and in the moment, real connection with a really divine God, full of life, full of love, full of grace. Thank you.